Hey, West Side, Dan Sutherland here to introduce our speaker for today for week three of Life Apps. This series is centered on the idea that following Christ is never easy, but it's simple if you stick to the basics. And you're going to enjoy Casey Robinson today. Casey is part of our worship team. He's also a young man with a dream to be a campus pastor. He brings a unique perspective to what it means to follow Christ. Enjoy Casey and week three of Life Apps. Well, good morning. You guys are too kind. We're going to start off with a little game this morning called Hot or Not. This is how we're going to play. We're going to show you an image up on the screen, and I want your opinion on whether or not that image is hot or not. We're going to start off with an easy one. You guys ready? Here we go. First image, please. Hot or not? Hot. Yeah, you guys, I told you it was an easy one. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. A little harder. Second image, hot or not? Hot. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, okay, third image, hot or not? No. <laughs> You're brutal. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't show a picture of K-State. I'd hate to see your reaction to that. Uh, next picture, please, hot or not? Hot. Wait, I heard a couple hots in the room. <laughs> I really don't get that, by the way, but uh, I've got a friend that has a life-size cutout of that guy, and we still love them anyway. Um, hey, our next picture, please. Hot or not? Hot. Oh, you guys didn't do it the last service. The last service goes, aw. That's my boy. I'm so proud of my boy. Of course, yeah, now he gets the aw. You're a guy, who, who's that kid? Well, now I get the aw that you know the kid. Uh, last picture, please. Hot or not? <laughs> For those of you that are new to Westside, this is your first time here. The reason we're laughing is that Pastor Dan Sutherland, our lead teaching pastor, that is his head. <laughs> Just to, And Pastor Dan, uh, if you're watching, thank you very much for your permission in using that photo. In life, we play this game, Hot or Not. It's a game of favorites. It's a game where we play uh, based and we get on our human label maker and we judge people based and label them according to their appearance. We play it in school. In fact, when we were in school, we did it a lot when someone new would come in and they would be dressed a little bit differently or they might have glasses or braces. It would determine how we label them and treat them. We also play this game of hot or not and this game of favorites at work. We play it even in church. We play it with different people of different political parties. We'll label them a certain way if they affiliate with a certain political party. We play this game of hot or not even with our students and our kids and their teams at sports. We'll play this game of acceptance based on how talented a kid is. We play this game of hot or not. Did you know that within five seconds of meeting someone, you and I can create a label. We can create a prejudgment of that person based on their appearance. In life, we label people according to four different categories. Write these down in your notes that you were given on the way in. The first one is we label people by their ethnicity. It's sad, but we still have racial prejudices alive in us today still. We'll label people according to by their race. We call it racism. And what we do is if I could give you a list of, uh, or a, a race right now, it would bring up a list of behaviors that you would associate and project on that entire race. Another way we label people is not just by ethnicity, but we'll label them according to their economic status. Write that in. We'll label people according to how rich they are, how much money they have, how many possessions they own. We'll label people according to how big their house is. Or what kind of car they drive. We'll even go so much as label people at, of certain subdivisions. Well, they are a part of this area. We'll label people not only of that, but we'll also label people according to the education they have or the school they went to. We'll say, well, they are an Ivy League graduate or they only went to a state school or they don't even have a high school education. We'll label people according to the economic status. We also label people according to the culture. Not only do we label people according to the country that they live in, but I've lived in Kansas City long enough over 10 years that I know that we even label people according to the county they live in. <laughs> you laugh because I'm right. We in Johnson County have a label of those in Wyandotte County. We in Wyandotte County have a label of those that live in Johnson County. And God forbid if we were to talk about the people on the other side of the state line, 
We label people according to, the, uh, to their culture. Well, another way we label in the culture is the, according to the way they dress. Well, whether or not they dress in all black will determine how we treat them. Or if they wear skinny jeans and they're a guy. <laughs> well, and, or it could be whether or not you work in a place where suits aren't the main attire and somebody in management wears a suit. We label them as suits. I've worked in places like that. We'll even label people according to the way that if they wear a cutoff shirt and conf- sport the Confederate flag. Not only do we label people according to the way they dress, but even by their accent. You know what? I wish, I really wish that I could speak to you in a British accent this morning. Because everything I would say would sound so intelligent. I could stand up here and go, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter. God says peanut butter. And you'd go to your wife, oh my goodness, did you just hear what he said? Peanut butter. Because of the accent I have. Now I'm playing fun with that, but we'll label people with a a draw of some type. Or if we don't live in one of these areas, but if some people in New York have certain opinions of people with different accents according to the area they live in. We also label people not only by these three categories, but the last one will label people. Well, actually, before we get to the last one, I want to talk about one other label in the cultures. We label people according to the religion. This is not your last blank, but I want to talk about it. We'll label people who are Muslims. We'll label people who are Jehovah's Witness, who are Mormons, who are Islamic. We have prejudices and projections on people who are these different religions. And, you know, it, it would be It's saddened that we don't even stop there. We'll even have labels for people that believe the same way we do and say, oh, they're staunch Southern Baptist. Or we'll label people saying they're Presbyterian, they're Methodist. We have a label for Pentecostals. We have a label for contemporary. We'll label people and project our prejudices on them based on their appearance and their affiliation. And then last, we label people according to age. We label people according to age. Young people label older people saying that they're out of touch with the reality and older people will label younger people saying they're not as mature as we were when we were that age. Have you ever thought about how you label people in these four categories? What's your response? What are your projections? What are the thoughts that you have toward these people? Sometimes we come up with thoughts like they're lazy Certain people or certain ethnicities might have an uneducated presupposition that we come up with. We'll say some are snobs, some are rednecks, some are fakes, they're phonies. We even have a label for kids who are smart, we call them geeks and nerds. We have a label for guys who are good in sports, we call them jocks. Not jock straps, we call them jocks. (laughs) We have labels for some that we call them criminals. We label some that dress a certain way, we call them easy. And we label some and project on them and we even say terrorist. You know, in my own life, I was reflecting about this in the last couple of weeks and I was trying to find something that I could share with you about how, man, how I label people. And I was really proud of myself because I try to treat people as equally as I can. I try not to have a bias of one race or one culture or one dressed uh, person over another or even one of uh, economic status or by age. I try to treat people as equally as I can. And I was really getting proud of myself and get a little arrogant until I went to Branson on the 4th of July weekend. (laughs) You laugh because you've been there. And all of a sudden... These prejudices began to become more alive and began to percolate deep inside of me. When at 3 a.m. on July 5th, I was awoken by the outside of my hotel complex turning into Baghdad, Iraq. The bad thing is these are my very own people. I grew up in a small town in southern Missouri with a bunch of black cat happy good old boys. And it was these very people that I was praying curses down, asking a she-bear to come out of the woods and just scare them. See, that's why you need to read your Bible, because there's stories like she-bears coming out of the woods. and you know, Just a little plug for God's word there, okay? No, seriously, I was in there, and that next morning, if you were in my hotel complex, I'm just telling you, I was not thinking good, happy thoughts about you, because you were not in my room, and because you were not in my room, I associated you with the person that was black cat happy out there, blowing up fireworks, waking me and my boy up. And my wife up at 3 a.m. And I walked around that place just looking at everybody. Was it you? (laughs) No, it was you, wasn't it? You look like you could be one of them. We all 
have prejudices in us that we label people by. As Pastor Dan said, my name is Casey, and I'm so excited to be here as we are smack dab in the middle in the third week of a series called Life Apps. During this series, we're looking through the book of James, and we're looking at five different principles that James pulls out. And last week, Pastor Matt talked about how when we apply God's principle, we're blessed. And that's the big idea of this. Look at the big idea. Write it down in your notes. God offers the wisdom we need. Download it and use it. In this series, we're understanding that it's not just good enough to have God's Word on your shelf. It's not just good enough to read God's Word. However, faith comes by hearing it and reading God's Word. What really happens in transformation and life change really begins to happen when we apply God's Word. That's the big idea of the series today. We're going to be looking at James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And we're going to be looking at how James talks about discovering favoritism, defines what it is, and how we are to conquer it. Today's big idea is this. To show favoritism is to sin. To show mercy is our response to Jesus' love for us. I'll repeat it. To show favoritism is to sin. To show mercy is our response to Jesus' love for us. Look at me here in James chapter 2. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to read along. If you're watching online, we're going to have the scripture up there on the screens for you. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? In this passage, James has two threads that I want to point out. The first is this. Favoritism is discrimination, and it happens when we act on our prejudgments. Write that in your notes. Favoritism is the same thing as discrimination. And when we show favor to one person or one group of things, what it does is that means we discriminate against someone else. Favoritism is to include someone to the exclusion of someone else. Call it what you want. Call it favoritism. Call it discrimination. Call it showing partiality. Call it prejudice. The truth is that when you and I label people in categories, we prejudge them based on the group or groups that person or persons are associated with. Now let me explain to you what favoritism is not. If you were to go with me on a ride and we were going to go out to eat after lunch and my wife was going to go with me, I'm going to show favor to my wife because she's my wife. I'm going to open the car door for her. I'm not going to open the door for you because she's my wife. Favoritism is not that. Favoritism is the action we take based on the projections from someone's appearance. It's when we prejudge someone based on the outward appearance. Jesus' half-brother James is illustrating how we discriminate in this passage. And he does this by telling the story of two people who are coming into a church meeting. He says the first, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit and make it kind of in our scenario here. The first comes driving in his BMW 7 Series. He walks in sport in his Armani jacket with his Rolex watch. And another person comes in riding his bicycle with his sleeping bag strapped to the back and probably in the same clothes he's worn for the last three days. James says that when we treat the rich man with the preferred treatment, with, the, the, with that favor and that partiality, what we've done is we've then discriminated against the poor person. When we show people favor based on their outward appearance to the exclusion of someone else, what we've done is we've shown favoritism to one and discriminated against the other. When we act only on our prejudgments of someone's appearance, we discriminate. Humans have this shallow nature inside of us that is only, we judge people only skin deep. We tend to judge a book by its cover. 
In the Old Testament, the prophet Samuel was called by God to anoint the second king of Israel. And God leads Samuel to the home of Jesse. Jesse then takes all his sons, gathers them together in the house, and begins to parade them before Samuel the prophet. And in verse 7 of 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see what God says when Samuel sees the oldest son who has the most potential, he's the tallest, the most educated, has has it all together. And this is what God says to Samuel about this. The Lord says to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Underline that. The Lord looks at the heart. Samuel then asks Jesse, are there any other sons? After he parades all of them and God says no to each one of them, are there any other sons? And and Jesse goes, well, there is one. He's the youngest though. He's not the most educated. He doesn't look the greatest. He doesn't look like a leader, but, and he's also a shepherd. He's with the sheep. Samuel at once says, we will not sit down until that kid is in our presence. We not only judge people by their outward appearance, but we'll also judge people according to what other people say. We call this gossip. You and I will create prejudices and we'll create prejudgments of people based on rumors. And what that does is that will affect the way that we treat that person. It might not even be true. Favoritism is discrimination and it happens when we act on our prejudgments. The second thread in this passage is this, is discrimination reveals our motives. We see that in verse 4. A motive is what drives you. It's the reason you do certain things. And when we discriminate, what is inside of us comes out. When we are motivated by selfish ambitions, we show favoritism to a person or, or a group of people over others based on what they can do for us. We'll show favoritism to someone who can help our image. We'll play this hierarchical game where where we create this pecking order based on what people can do for us or our self-image or maybe even our social status. We'll treat people according to what they can do for our family, what they can do for our kid to get on that specific team or into that certain school or how they can help them move up in the batting order on the ball team. We'll show favoritism Not only there, but we'll show favoritism at work where we'll treat people based on what they can do for us to help us land the deal, to help us get the promotion, to help us get that new job. We'll treat, show favoritism to certain people over others based on the selfish, evil motives of our heart. And that's what discrimination really shows us. Not only does favoritism show us our motives, but discrimination shows our motives. Because when we discriminate against somebody, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to make them lower than we are. We're exalting ourselves. We're making ourselves more important by discriminating against them. Discrimination reveals our motives. And as we look at this scripture and acknowledge that favoritism, discrimination is a problem, we need to ask the question, so how do we address this? How do we conquer this? How do we, as Christ followers, deal with favoritism. Well, James and the rest of this passage that we're going to look at gives you and I a triple threat approach into conquering favoritism. And he begins with this one right here. Write it down in your notes. In order to conquer favoritism, we first have to adopt the mind of Christ. James 2.8 shares this principle with us. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. James wasn't the only person who quoted this passage out of Leviticus 19.18. James was there when he heard his brother Jesus answer a man's questions on what was the greatest commandment of all the commandments in the Old Testament. What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds with what the rabbis of that day called the Shema. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then Jesus adds a second commandment in tandem with that and says, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. 
To adopt the mind of Christ is to have a mind that is guided by love. Jesus shows no favoritism with his love. John 3, 16 is a beautiful explanation and a beautiful example of this when it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I love that word that says whosoever because that means anyone. That means it was love that sent him to the cross and to, not just to save some people, but anyone who believes on him. Jesus doesn't, not, doesn't only show favoritism with his love on the cross, but he shows no favoritism when choosing his followers. When he first chose his disciples, the 12 disciples, he didn't go after the most educated. He didn't go with the ones that had the most money or the most potential or were the most popular. Jesus chose ordinary men. He chose tax collectors who were the worst of the worst. He chose fishermen. He even chose a thief and he chose a good for nothing, outspoken klutz named Peter. Not only did God choose these men, but he chose to die for you and me. His death on the cross wasn't exclusive, but it's inclusive. Jesus so shows no favoritism. And in order to conquer favoritism, we have to adopt the mind of Christ, which is a mind guided by love. Next, we have to call favoritism what it is. And I'll be real honest with you. James says it clearly. It's sin. Write that down. It's sin. Look at verse 9. It says, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. It is wrong to discriminate. It's wrong to show favoritism to one group over their, of their appearance based on another group. And when we are wrong as Christians, this demands a response, and that response as Christ followers is called repentance. However, I feel that some of us have a, misunderstanding of what repentance really means. A lot of us believe that repentance is just feeling sorry and saying sorry for it. However, I think most of us are sorry more that we're caught than we're actually sorry for the act we've done. Repentance is not just feeling sorry. Repentance is not just feeling guilty about it either. You'll feel guilty about a lot of things in life, but that doesn't mean you're repentant of it. Repentance is more than even confessing it. Confession is part of repentance, but there's more to repentance than that. The New Testament word for repentance, we learned this a couple weeks ago when Pastor Troy McMahon was here teaching in What at the Church, and he used this word metanoeo, and it means to change our mind. It means to change and make a decision in our mind and change it. When we repent, and we change our mind and adopt the mind of Christ, our actions change too. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. It means to do a 180 degree, as a military term, it means to make an about face and turn the other way in your actions be out of a changed mind. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, and as we adopt the mind of Christ, you and I can change our mind about favoritism and discrimination and about people we show partiality to, and we can change our actions as well. Last thing, to overcome favoritism, we must show mercy to everyone. Not just some people, but everyone. Verse 13 says, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Mercy means to withhold judgment. That's what mercy does. It withholds what we deserve. When you apply mercy to your prejudices, what you're doing is you're going to tell somebody, I'm not going to treat you based on my prejudgments of you. When we apply mercy, that might mean taking that prejudice that we've created against someone based on the rumor or gossip and applying mercy to that prejudgment and treating them totally different than the way that we think they deserve. 
to be treated. Mercy means to withhold judgment, and Jesus withheld his judgments and shows mercy to us by going to the cross so that when we believe in him and when we follow him, all the judgments you and I deserve, his mercy is then applied to them, eradicating our punishment. This is the quintessential display of mercy. And as Christ followers, because we've been shown mercy, we need to show mercy to others. When Jesus, when teaching us to pray, told us that we are to forgive others so we too can be forgiven. Mercy, mercy is just not something we apply to our prejudgments of people, but mercy is something we apply even when people willfully and wrongfully act against us. Mercy is what we apply in these situations. And when we extend that mercy, Jesus says, and James says here, you will receive mercy. God's mercy plays no favorites. And if you're here for the first time in a long time to church, or you're here because a friend of yours is following Christ and you want to know more about this Jesus that they live for, I want to let you know that Jesus shows no favoritism with his love. Jesus' love plays no favorites. His mercy plays no favorites. If you believe in him, he says anyone who believes in him will have everlasting life. His love plays no favorites. And that's why as Christ followers, you and I must show mercy to everyone. It's because of his mercy and love towards us that we are to be displays of mercy to others. Mercy is our response to Jesus showing us mercy and extending to us the invitation of grace. So the next time you are in a situation that, is inc that will incline you to, to discriminate, I want you to adopt the mind of Christ. James tells us to adopt the mind of Christ, which is a mind guided by love, and then to show mercy to that person. That might happen when you're at work this week. And that person who kind of doesn't fit in with any of the other groups in the office comes into the break room or comes next to the water cooler and sits down next to you. That's your opportunity to adopt the mind of Christ, a mind guided by love, and show mercy to them. That might mean that the next time that couple walks into church and sits next to you that you've heard the rumors about, you apply mercy to your prejudgments of them. Or when you're taking out the trash and that person of a different ethnicity who's your neighbor is walking along the sidewalk and you guys just come together at the same point as you're pulling your trash can to the curb. It's your opportunity to adopt the mind of Christ and show mercy. Or maybe it's when you're at your kid's next ball game. And that family that doesn't have as much as everybody else on the team, their kids might not be as talented. Pulls up next to you, parks next to you, walks into the stadium with you, and sits next to you on, your, on the bleachers. That's your opportunity to adopt the mind of Christ and show mercy. To show favoritism is to sin. To show mercy is our response to Jesus' love for us. I'm going to give us an opportunity to respond to this message. And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to a minute here in a, in a, in a moment. And I want to set this up this way. As I was talking and as we were going through this passage together, maybe describing the four categories of people. There might have been someone or a group of people that you were enlightened by Holy Spirit as to someone you are inclined to discriminate against or show favoritism to out of evil desires, or out of wrong motives. If there are one of these categories and there's a person that comes to mind that God brought to you, I want us to do this. I want us to tell God we're sorry. I want us to say thank you for forgiving us, and then I want you to do this. I want you to think of the next time you're going to run into that person because we all know when we're going to run into them. We'll know it, and you know it, 
And I want you to think of now how you're going to change your action to that person. Think of now how you're going to, to adopt the mind of Christ and apply mercy in that situation. With that as the criteria, will you take about 30 seconds to a minute and bow your head with me? And let's use this time to repent. Jesus, we are so grateful that you have extended mercy toward us. And it's out of that example that you've commissioned us to show mercy to others. We're sorry for the way we've treated people based on the labels we've given them. And God, we change our mind now here And with the help of Holy Spirit in our life to do a regeneration in our heart, may we not just be able to change our mind, but God, may that change of mind lead to a change of action. So the next time we run into this person or that group of people, we can show mercy to them. Thank you for being the quintessential display of mercy and love that we can follow. In your name, amen.